Hello everyone. Um, in this short video, I'm gonna talk about uh, chapter four, which is time value of money. But before we get started, let me briefly introduce the structure of the textbook and uh, what I need to what I need you to do before we meet on uh, this Friday. Um, so, as I said in the first lecture, um, the textbook is a custom edition from Brook College, and it's a combination of two textbooks. Uh, we have two chapters from um, a book by Ross Westerfield and Jordan. Um, so we have chapter four and chapter five. Um, so we're gonna call that book Ross book. And we also have 13 chapters from a book by um, Jordan Miller and Delvin. So that book, we call it a Jordan book. Uh, so the first chapter is from the Ross chapter, okay? Uh, now, in order to use this video efficiently, uh, I also need you to um, download a notes, okay? So where to get the notes? If you go to the syllabus, um, you can find the syllabus um, in the uh, black uh, on the blackboard. So if you on page three, there is a link to a Dropbox folder. So if you just copy that and paste it here, okay? You want to delete the little dots. And um, now you see um, under this folder, there are several uh, files already. So I need, I need you to download the first one, which is called the notes for chapter four student version. So you click that. And um, I actually need you to print it because there are a lot of things that you need to write on it. Uh, but in order to print it, uh, don't directly print it from here because sometimes things are going to be messy. So you want to first download it. Use direct download. And then you're going to open it. And you can print it from here. So remember, don't uh, print directly from the Dropbox. So if you open the student version notes, um, you can see that there, I intentionally leave a lot of the uh, stuff blank. So the purpose is to um, ask you guys to fill in those blanks, okay? Uh, so the content of these notes are gonna be exactly the same from the, uh, the slides I'll be using in this video, okay? Only difference is that uh, there are a lot of things that you need to fill in while you're watching this video. Um, so another thing is that uh, on this notes, um, I actually have everything for chapter four. Uh, but in this video, I'm only going to cover up to, if you look at this notes, okay, so let's see. Uh, there are seven pages. Uh, but in this video, I'm only going to cover into page three, okay? Because into page three, those are the, um, the first part, and that's the... Um, very very important part of this chapter so i want to uh, film this video for you so that you can watch back and forth so that you make sure you understand the material okay so again in this video we only cover up to um, page three um, and everything else uh, we're gonna cover it uh, in class when we meet on friday um, okay uh, so and also the other thing is that you don't need to worry if you know, you don't have the complete version. After uh, we finish chapter four, I'm, I'm going to post the complete version with everything filled. Uh, so that you, uh, so uh, don't worry, you will have the full version notes. Okay. So uh, now let's get started. So print the um, student version notes and then come back to this video. Okay. So now let's get started with uh, chapter four. So uh, there are several uh, very imp uh, there are several important principles in finance. Okay, uh, the first principle is that money has a time value. So what does that mean? Suppose I ask you a question. Um, if I if you, I give you two options, one is that I give you one hundred dollars today. The other one is I give you one hundred dollars uh, in a year. Which one would you choose? So think about that. Now, most of you probably will choose $100 today. Uh, why? Because if you have $100 today, you can 
you can invest it. Um, and one year later, potentially you will have more than $100, right? So $100 today is worth more than $100 tomorrow, okay? Uh, so that is one reason why uh, money has a time value. Uh, and the second reason is that um, money today is certain, right? If I give you $100, you know it's certain, but if I tell you that I'm gonna give you $100 in a year, uh, then one year later, there's this risk potentially. So there's a chance that you might not get the $100. So the second reason is that there's a risk, okay? So um, therefore, uh, the very first important principle is that money today is worth more than money tomorrow. And the second principle is that um, there is risk and return trade-off. What does that mean is that um, if you think about uh, you're investing your money, um, the return is the money you can make from this investment. And the risk refers to the fact that uh, there is uncertainty. So uh, you might earn a lot of money, but you also uh, might lose money. So that is the uncertainty. Uh, the risk and return trade-off refers to the fact that uh, if you want to uh, have a higher return, if you want to make more money, you have to take more risk. Okay. On the other hand, if you take more risk, uh, potentially you can uh, expect to make more money. Okay. To give you a real life example, uh, think about you have, let's say, $10,000. If you put this money in the bank, that is risk free. Okay. You know what interest rate you're going to get in the future. Okay. So there's no risk, but the return you can get from this investment is very low. Okay, nowadays in the U.S., our return uh, from depositing money in the bank is um, around 0%. Um, and on the, on the other hand, if you invest your money in the stock market, uh, you potentially you're expecting a higher return because there's a larger price changes in the stock market. Uh, but on the other hand, you're faced with a higher risk because you're likely, um, potentially you're going to lose money. Okay, so if you put your money in the stock market, you, you expect a higher return, but you also take more risk. Okay, um, so in the, in, in the real world, nothing comes free. So if you want to hide more money, you have to take high risk. That is the reality. Okay, um, and the third um, principle is that um, cash flows are the sources of value. Uh, in finance, we care a lot about the cash flows. Uh, because if you think about some financial assets, uh, for example, stocks, um, we're going to elaborate more about what is stock in the future chapters, but potentially you guys have an idea of what is stock. Okay, so that is, uh, so if you own a stock, that, that means you have ownership of a firm, right? So if you have uh, stocks of Ample, then uh, you have ownership of Ample and you're entitled to receive dividend. Um, and uh, when they go bankruptcy, you're entitled to claim the residual assets. So that is stock. Um, now, if you think about uh, stock, that's a particular uh, one type, that's just one type of financial assets, okay? So if you think about uh, a stock, um, the, the reason you're buying stock is because uh, you're expecting the future dividends. Okay, so that is where the value of stock comes from. Okay, that's why w that's what we mean uh, by cash flow is the source of value. If you're expecting no dividends in the future and you're expecting um, no payment in the future, you're not gonna buy the stock. Okay, um, so in finance, uh, we care a little bit different from what we care in, in accounting. In accounting, you, we talk a lot about net income. Um, but in finance, it's less about net income because um, you learned accounting, you know that uh, the net income can, um, can uh, take two forms. One is cash, another one might be you know, accounts receivable. Um, but uh, the accounts receivable part could be risky, right? Um, so, uh, so in finance, we care about the, the cash flow because that's the, that's the money you can, that's, the, that's something you can use to make your payment, pay your employees, or you know, pay your rents. So cash flow is really the source of value, not so much about net income. A firm can have very high net income, but if the quality of the net income is, very, is not very high, it's purely you know, accounts receivable, it doesn't uh, value that much.
Okay, so those are the three basic principles. Um, so what are we gonna do in this textbook is that we first gonna spend a few chapters on the first topic, money has a time value. Uh, we're gonna learn how to, um, we're gonna uh, try to solve the several questions. Um, suppose you have $1 today, how much is it gonna be worth in the future? Or vice versa, if you have $100 in, you're expecting $100, um, in, in one year, how much uh, should they be worth today, okay? So that is the first principle. We're gonna learn a lot of calculation, and that is really the basic stuff in this textbook. You have to learn this um, first topic very, very well, okay? And after that, we're gonna move on to the second principle. Uh, there is a risk and return trade-off. There, we're gonna learn how to calculate return, how to calculate risk. Um, and the cash flow is the source of, uh, of value is really embedded in the first uh, principle, okay? Um, so that's what, we, uh, what we're gonna do in this uh, whole chapter, uh, this textbook. Uh, so let's first get started with the first topic, money has a time value. So there are two several, uh, two uh, important concepts. Um, the first one is present value, uh, that is what a uh, cash flow is worth at the beginning of an investment period. We, all, we often call present value PV. Um, and um, the second concept is future value, that's how much a cash flow is worth in the future, uh, and we we'll refer this as uh, FV. Um, so let me give you a brief example, suppose I say that um, I have $100 today, it's gonna be worth $106 uh, in a year. Then in this example, this $100 is the PV, uh, and this $106 is um, the future value, FV, okay? Um, we also wanna learn a very important tool to help us uh, uh, solve the questions in this chapter. This tool is called a timeline. Uh, it is a linear representation of the timing and amount of cash flows. Okay, uh, the way we use timeline is very simple. So suppose um, in this example, I lend out one thousand dollars at the beginning, and then I receive two hundred dollars in each of the following six periods. Uh, so. There are several cash flows in this example. How do we plot it uh, on a timeline? Um, this is what we do, okay? Uh, so you draw a line that goes into the future, okay? So time never goes backward, so it goes into the future. Um, and you put the time period on top. So from this example, we have six periods. So you're gonna plot uh, six periods um, and then we're gonna put the cash flows at the bottom, okay? So at the very beginning, um, this beginning could be today or could be uh, one year from today, uh, but that's just the beginning of the investment period. If, if you're lending out the money in one year and receiving the money in the following six years, then the time zero could be uh, one year from now, okay? But that's the beginning. Uh, now at the bottom, we put uh, the cash flows uh, at the very beginning, you lend out $1,000. That is a cash outflow. So we use a negative number to represent cash outflows. Uh, during the six following periods, every period you receive $200. So we put them there. Okay, this is the way you draw time uh, timeline. On this timeline, there are several things uh, you need to pay special attention to. Um, here we're only talking about periods, okay? Each period, it could be one year, a month, or a day, depending on the setup in the question we analyze. So if the cash flows happens every month, then this one period could be a month. If those cash flows are happening every year, then each, uh, each being represents one year, okay? So it really depends on the question you should be very flexible with that. Um, now, the second thing we need to note is that at any point in time, let's say uh, time one, uh, this time will represent the end of the first period. 
but also it's the beginning of the period two. Okay, now time zero is the beginning of the first period, of course, but time two it is the end of the second period, but it's also the beginning of the third period. Okay, the same thing for uh, time six, it's the end of period six, but it's also the beginning of the next period, which we didn't draw here, but you can also think of it as the beginning of period seven. Okay, uh, so that's just one example. Let's look at another example. Uh, suppose in year zero, um, you lend out $1,000, and in year one, you receive 200, year two, you receive 300, and year three, you receive $600. You probably notice that you're receiving more than what you lend out, but that's normal, right? Because if you lend out money, you want to receive some uh, uh, extra money as the interest. That's your uh, payoff. Um, so uh, I want you guys to pause here for a moment just to try to see if you can draw this timeline by yourself. Okay, so here's the uh, answer for this one. Uh, you have three periods um, and you put uh, the cash flows at the bottom. Now, with those tools and the basic concepts in mind, we can start to look at, um, um, we can start to jump into um, the calculations. The first type of calculation we can learn in this chapter is, suppose we know the present value, how do we find out the future value of the cash flow, okay? Uh, now, in order to know the future value, we have to know several things. In, besides the present value, you also need to know what interest rate you're earning um, and how many uh, periods are there in between, okay? Uh, so before we introduce the formulas, I want to use a very simple example just to show you uh, the basic ideas behind this calculation. Okay, so um, here's an example. So again, we're first using a numerical example, and then after this, we're gonna move on to the formula derivation. Um, so in the example, you deposit $100 in a bank at an interest rate of 6% per period. Uh, I want you to calculate what is the future value in one p uh, in the first period, the second period, and the nth period. In other words, I want to know uh, how much money you have in the bank account after one year, after two years, or after n years. Oh, or, um, sorry, I'm not talking about years. Um, everything is in terms of period here, okay? One period can be one year, can be one month, okay? So, now, um, so for, for the first period, uh, I'm assuming that all of you guys know what interest rate means. Okay, that is the percentage of the money you're gonna uh, earn from this investment. Okay, so the six percent means that for each dollar you can earn six cents. If it's one hundred dollars, that means you earn six dollars. Um, so, for the first period, how much are you gonna have at this time? Um, you probably know the answer. It's quite simple. Um, how much you have here should equal to one hundred and six dollars. That equals to the initial investment you made, $100. But also you're earning some 6% interest. So uh, the dollar amount of the interest is $6. Okay, so for the first period, it's very simple. Now, let's move on to the second period. Now, I want you guys to pause again here to think about um, how do you find out your future value in the second period. Uh, if you think about it, there are actually two ways. Uh, there are two uh, answers. Depending on um, how, uh, uh, what are the rules for calculating the interest, okay? In the first scenario, you could have $112, and $112 okay? How do we get that? Uh, you started with $100 um, as the initial investment, and each period, you earn 6% on the $100, okay? So for over the two periods, in total, you earn $100 times 6% and times two. So you have an interest of $12. So 
So in total, we have one hundred and twelve dollars. Now this is this is probably not what you have in mind. What you have in mind might be this. Okay, you could also have one hundred dollar one hundred twelve and thirty six cents. How can you get this? Now because we remember that by the end of the first period, you already have one hundred and six dollars. Okay, in the second setup, if you're earning interest on the total amount, so that means over the second period, your new principal, how much you started at time one, is now one hundred and six dollars. And if you're earning interest on the total. One hundred and six dollars. Then over the second period, this is the interest you're gonna be earning. Okay, so in total, your value by the end of the second period would be the sum, which is one hundred and twelve dollars and thirty six cents. Okay, so there's a key difference between those two、uh, ways. The first way is called simple interest. Using simple interest. The investment will only earn interest on the original principal, so that's why、uh, over the second period, although we already have one oh six here, we're still only、uh, earning interest on the first、uh, on the original principal. Okay, so、um, for each period, you have six dollars. Now,、um, under the compound interest, things are a little bit different. You can earn interest. On both the initial principal and the reinvested interest during the previous period, so the idea here is that、um, we earned six dollars in the first period as interest, and then over the second period,、uh, we are reinvesting the six dollars. So we put the six dollars again back into the bank, and, and that's why we can earn six percent interest on that six dollars as well. Okay, so under the compound interest,、uh, you are you are.、Uh, Uh, principal is changing all the time. Okay, so every period, your principal、uh, grows by the amount、uh, of your interest that、uh, of the interest that you earned in the previous period. Okay,、um, so that is the key difference between those and those two methods. Okay, so again, simple interest you earn interest always only on the Original principal, but under compound interest, you can earn interest on interest. Okay, so、uh, think about、um, as a as an investor, which way would you prefer?、Um, you would prefer compound interest, right? Because compound gives you、uh, more money. Okay. Now.、Uh, Now that you know the difference between simple and compound, I want you to calculate how much are you gonna have、uh, by the end of the third period using both method. Okay, so pause here for another moment and think about、uh, to do the calculation. Okay,、uh, so here's the answer. Using simple interest, you will have one hundred and eighteen dollars. That's one hundred dollars initial principal, and、uh, for each period you earn six dollars as interest, and each period you earn the same thing. So over three periods, you have eighteen dollars in total as interest. Whereas in the compound interest,、um, remember by the end of the second period, you also you already have one hundred and twelve dollars and thirty six cents. Uh, so that's your new principal in the third period, and the interest you're gonna earn is the new principal times six percent. That is your interest. So you're using compound、um, method. Your money is gonna be、uh, the value is gonna be one hundred and nineteen dollars and ten cents. I hope you got this right. Okay. So here, up to here, it's a numerical example.、Um, just to Get you guys familiarized with、uh, the basic、uh, idea behind it. Now let's move on to the、uh, formula derivation. So the basic principle in this formula derivation is that at any point in time, okay, at at the end of any period, the future value should equal to the value at the end of the previous period plus the interest that you earn during this period. 
okay using this example um, at any point in time uh, this value should equal to how much you have by the end of the second period and how much interest you earn over this period okay and this principle applies to um, any scenario uh, one thing I forgot to say is that um, in the following uh, it, during this textbook we will be focusing on compound interest not so much on simple okay so we will be doing only compound interest okay so now we're deriving the formula for the compound so um we're gonna i'm gonna introduce several um notation so the r stands for um, the periodic interest rate okay so in the previous example the R would be the 6% okay that is the interest rate you're gonna earn over each period um, and um, I'm gonna use T to stands for the number of periods okay you will see in a second so um, using the compound interest the future value in the first period will equal to the initial principal plus the interest you earn over the first period, which is the PV times the interest rate. Okay, so that gives us PV times one plus R. Now, during the second period, again, it's gonna your future value by the end of the second period should equal to how much you started with plus the interest you earn. So how much we start with in the first period uh, the in, uh, during the second period that's going to be how much you have by the end of the first period so this is the amount and then you're earning interest on this whole amount so the interest will be the principal PV times 1 plus R then times the interest rate which is R okay now if we uh, rearrange this we will have PV times 1 plus R times 1 plus R okay so you can collect those two um, items together so you have PV times 1 plus R squared okay so if you think about it you probably already figure out uh, the patterns okay so if we goes to the nth period goes to the teeth period then the future value by the teeth period should equal to PV times 1 plus R to the power of T okay so if you go back here, this t here really equals to 1, right? And in the second period, this t equals to 2. Now if you go to any period, this t will be here. Okay, it's on the power. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so let me go back. All right, so uh, we're not done with the formula yet because we have a problem, okay? The problem is that oftentimes we do not directly know R and T. Rather, we know annual uh, percentage rate, uh, number of years and number of periods per year, okay? So what does that mean? That means, remember in this formula, in order to calculate future value, we need to know R and T. Okay, but most of the time we don't know it directly. Okay, so for example, you're making, a, you're taking a mortgage from a bank. Uh, in order to calculate the future value or anything like that, you need to know the interest rate uh, per month, right? Because you're making monthly payment in a mortgage, so you need to know the monthly uh, interest rate and how many months are there. Uh, but because of the convention, the quotation convention, uh, most of the banks, they only tell you uh, what is the interest rate per year, okay? So they don't tell you how much is the interest uh, rate we charge every month. They tell you the annual ones, okay? And they tell you how many years are there, okay? Uh, so that is the problem. Um, let's first look at what is annual percentage rate and then we'll think about how do we resolve the problem. So what is annualized percentage rate? Um, it is the interest that's earned or paid in one year without compounding. Okay, uh, so the annualized percentage rate simply equals to the interest rate per, per period times the number of periods per year. Uh, 
Uh, for example, if uh, each period is a month and the interest in each month is 1%, then the annual percentage rate is simply 12%. That is 1% times 12. And if the uh, each period is a quarter and the interest rate in each quarter is 1%, then the annual percentage rate is 4%. Okay, so that is simple, right? So I equal to R times M. So now we oftentimes we know I directly, but we in eventually we want to know R. Okay, so how do we resolve the problem? Easy, right? Just solve for R and T. Okay, so because we know that I equal to R times M, the R simply equal to I divided by M. So that's the annual percentage rate divided by how many periods are there. Now, what about T? Uh, T is the number of periods. Okay, so if it's monthly, we want to know how many months are there, but instead we only know how many years. How do we get number of months? We simply use the number of years times how many months are there. Right? So this applies to any uh, length of periods. Okay, so T equals to number of years times how many periods per year. So now once we have those, we can just plug in those back into our original formula. Right? So we have PV times 1 plus R to the power of T. Now R, we don't know R directly, but we know I. But R equals to I divided by M. Okay? And T equals to M times M. Um, so again, so here are the uh, notation I'll be using throughout the semester. R is the interest rate per period, T is number of periods, um, I is the annual percentage rate, and M is the number of periods per year, and N is number of years. Okay, so uh, let's look at several examples related to this formula. Uh, in the first example, suppose the interest is compounded every year. Okay, so in this example, I want you to think about uh, what should be the formula. Okay, uh, so here is the answer. Because each period now in this example equals to a year. Therefore, a number of periods in one year simply equal to one because over one year there is one year. Okay, so the future value in t periods now. Uh, that is t years. In this example, will equal to PV times 1 plus r to the power of t, but r simply equal to i divided by m, that's 1, and t equal to um, number of years times um, number of periods in each year. Okay, so eventually we have this. It's quite simple. Now, the second example if the interest is compounded every month, how would the formulas be look like? So here is the answer. E, one period is one month. So number of periods per year equals to 12 because there are 12 months in a year. So M is 12. Now we replace everything in the formula. So the future value in T periods or N years equals to PV times 1 plus R equal to I divided by 12. Okay, so I is interest rate per year again, and there are 12 months. Therefore, each month the interest rate is I divided by 12. Okay, uh, so how many periods are there? That's going to be how many years are there times 12. That gives you how many months. I'm sorry about this. Um, so in the third example, interest is compounded uh, quarterly. So I want you to pause here for a second and write down the formula for this one. So in this one, each period is a quarter. Therefore, a number of periods uh, per year, which is the M, will equal to 4. So the formula will be like this. Okay, so I divided by 4 is the interest rate per quarter. And N times 4 is how many quarters are there. All right. Now, Let's move on to a numerical example. So in this numerical example, I will show you how to do this in a calculator, how to solve the numerical uh, questions in a, in a financial calculator. So you deposited $1,000 with Citibank at an interest rate of 
twelve percent. So that means I equal to twelve percent. So remember, in this textbook, uh, when I tell you the interest rate is blah blah blah, and this interest rate is always annual percentage rate. That is always the interest rate per year. Now suppose the interest is compounded every half year. Um, please calculate your account balance in five years. So essentially what's this, what this question is asking is the future value in five years, right? And the interest is compounded every half year. That means each period is a half year. So think about how many periods are there in a year. There are two, okay? Uh, so here's, so, uh, Here's the uh, formulas that you're going to use, right? Uh, so future value will equal to present value, which is 1,000, plus 1 plus the annual percentage rate, 12%, divided by how many periods are there. So 6% uh, will be the interest rate per a half year. And how many periods are there? We have 10 periods. That's five years times two. So uh, eventually you will find the future value equals to uh, $1,790.85. Uh, so here I would love to show you how to use a calculator to solve this problem. Let me show you uh, the calculator. Okay. Uh, so I'll first show you how to use the simple uh, calculator function, okay? So this is uh, an example of the financial calculator. How to use it? So first you're gonna turn it on using the on and off button. And then, um, so if we wanna just use the formula, um, the challenging part is how to do the power function, right? So we have, uh, 1.06 to the power of 10. How do we do that? Um, now to do the power function, you're gonna use this button, y to the power of x function. Okay, so you're gonna go uh, 1.06 and click the power function and then click 10 and then equal. So that's 1.79, okay? So that is the value uh, inside the parenthesis, and then you use that times 1,000 and equal. Okay, so that gives you the answer. Now, um, we also have a shortcut, okay? So we can also use the financial calculator function. Okay, so that's the reason I asked you to buy this financial calculator. How do we use that? Let me show you. So again, you turn it on and off. Now, to use the uh, financial calculator, the most important buttons are the ones on the third row. The on the third row, the first button, uh, on the first button, it says n, that's number of periods, and i over the second button, i over y is the interest rate per period. That is the r in my notation, and the third one is PV, obviously that's present value. And the third one, PMT, that stands for payment. So we're gonna use the payment in the following chapter, but in this chapter, it's always zero, okay? We're gonna uh, have non-zero values in the future chapters. And the FV stands for future value, okay? Now the way you use this, it's quite simple, you just in order to calculate uh, any parameter, let's say we wanna calculate future value. Now what you do is you simply plug in all the values for the previous four parameters, and then you're gonna use the compute function and the compute FV, okay? So let's try this example. Um, so you have $1,000, you deposit $1,000, so that is the present value. So you would go one, thousand and then you hit PV okay you see on the screen it says PV equal to 1000 now um, and um, um, so an interest rate of 12 percent so that means um, our interest rate per month per 
per quarter. Um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, per half year, or interest rate per quarter will be six percent, right? So you're gonna put i over y as six percent. So you're gonna click six and i over y. Okay. Now, uh, please note that instead of putting 0.06, we're putting only six here because in the financial calculator it adds uh, the percent sign automatically. Okay, so you only need to put six and then i over y. Um, and number of periods, we already know that that it's five years, so it's ten uh, periods. So ten and then n. Um, and lastly, payment is zero, so zero payment. Okay, so we've input everything we know. Now the only thing we need to do is compute future value. So you're gonna hit the compute button on the very top, uh, top corner. So compute FV. You see we have a value here. It says future value equal to negative $1,790.85. Okay, so uh, in the financial calculator, the present value and the future value, they are always of net, uh, opposite signs. Okay? That is because it assumes that the PV is uh, cash uh, inflow, therefore you will have a cash outflow. Right? So um, now if you want to set, a, you, if you want to have a future value uh, that's positive, then what you can do is you can put the PV as a negative value, okay? So we can try again. Let's say that we put uh, P, uh, P, uh, present value as negative now. So 1,000 negative and PV. Number of periods, 10 and um, interest rate per period is six and I over Y. Uh, payment again, zero. And then you go compute future value. Okay, so now you see it's positive now. Okay, so um, most of the time when we solve those problems, we don't care that much about the sign itself. Okay, so we care about the absolute value. So you can put it, the PV as either positive or negative. Okay, so that's how you do this. Now, um, the other thing I want to show you is that um, every time after you do the financial calculator, uh, use the financial calculator, um, after each problem, remember to clear the memory, okay? Because if you don't clear the memory, uh, the value of those parameters will stay the same as the previous one, okay? So let's say uh, if last time the n is five and you don't clear the memory and you forget to change it, um, then the n in the next problem will still be five, okay? Which might not be true in the next example. So you wanna clear the memory. So how do you do that? You're gonna go second, and uh, click the future value button, okay? And uh, second, quit. Why do we clear the F future value button? Because you see on top of the future value button, it says CLR TVM. That is clear time value of money, okay? So by clicking the second, we're triggering the secondary function of that button. Okay, so you see that for a lot of the buttons, they actually have the secondary function. Okay, so we'll use that in the future. So in order to trigger those, we have to go second and um, the button. That it's kind of like the shift button on our keyboard for our laptops. Uh, so that's how we clear the memory. Again, second, future value, second, uh, quit. Okay, uh, another thing is that sometimes you might wanna change the number of decimals, okay? So, uh, because here you only have two decimals, okay? Um, sometimes you, you wanna maybe four or five just to be more accurate in the answers. Uh, you can do that. So how do we do that? You go second, um, the last one, um, the button on the very last row, the dot button. Uh, you see on, on top of the, um, the dot button, it says format. So that's the secondary function. That's why we go second format. And now it says DEC equal to two. That means there are two decimals. If you wanna set it to be eight, you go eight and enter button. So now you see you already have eight decimals, okay? So to quit from the setting, uh, you can go second and quit. 
now you're going back to normal and you have eight decimals. Okay. Mm, and one more thing you want to make sure is that uh, you want to make sure the uh, um, so just follow me and do this. You go second i over y um, and you see the second if you click second i over y you see p over y okay that is the secondary function of i over y you want to make sure this number is one okay if it's not one you can click one and enter okay now it's one and you're gonna further use the down arrow button to go down if you go down you're gonna see that uh, c o you're gonna see something like c over y equal to a value make sure that one is also uh, one if it's not one you again go one enter okay um, and that's it so you, so you want to make sure that those two values are one okay so uh, to go back you go second quit Okay. So that is how you use financial calculator to solve this problem, the future value problem. We'll learn more in the class. Uh, let me show you just two more examples. Okay. Um, in this example, I I'm asking you to, cal to fill in those blanks. Okay. So for each uh, cell, you need to calculate a future value. Okay. For example, in the first, uh, in the cell on the second row and the second column, uh, you need to calculate the future value when the present value is 1,000 uh, and the interest rate is 5% annually and the compounding frequency is annually. Okay, uh, And I ask you to calculate the future value in five years. So uh, I'm going to show you just two, how to get the, those two numbers in, on the first row. Okay. So to get the number in the first um, cell, you're going to do this. Again, you turn it on. Um, number of periods in the, in the first one because it's annually and there are five years. So the number of periods is simply five. So five n i over y is five because it's 5% annually. Uh, so each, each period, the interest rate is 5%. Uh, present value is a thousand present value and again payment is zero so zero payment now compute future value so you see you have a value of one thousand two hundred seventy six dollars and twenty eight cents to get the number in on the uh, fifth column and the second row you're gonna do the following okay so let's clear the memory second your memory and second quit. So in this one, the interest is compounded monthly. Okay, so that means each period is a month. How many periods are there? Because it's five years and it's monthly. So the number of periods is going to be five times 12 and equal that's 60. So we're going to set 60 equal to n. And I over Y, now the interest rate per year is 15%. So interest rate per month equal to 15 divided by 12. So each month it's 1.25%. So we're going to set that equal to I over Y. Present value, 1,000. Payment, 0. And future value. So two thousand one hundred and seven dollars and eighteen cents. Okay, so I think I've shown you I've shown you enough uh, examples to uh, to make sure that you know how to do the quiz. Okay, so now uh, after this, we're done with this video. What you need to do now is to uh, finish um, to fill the blanks on this table and also do quiz one. Okay, so if you go to uh, connect, um, if you go to connect, you will see a quiz one. So if you go to student view, so you see um, there are a lot of things that's past you. Don't worry, I will remove those. Okay, those are just some uh, leftovers from previous course. So. Um, 
if you scroll to the very bottom, you see there's a quiz that's due on February 5th um, at 2.30 p.m. That's right before the start of the um, in-person meeting. Okay, so make sure you finish the quiz one. And I changed the rule a little bit. So for the quiz one, you have to earn above 90% in order to earn the credit. If you earn less than 90, if you get ni less than 90% correct, then you earn nothing. Okay, so I'm sorry about the rule change, because, uh, but I just want to make sure that um, you guys uh, know enough to, um, uh, to, to, for us to move on to the future topics. Okay, so the quiz one itself is not very uh, difficult. Okay, it just it's very intuitive and follows what we uh, talk about in this video. Okay, so make sure you do those correctly. Okay, all right, so that's it for this video. I hope um, it, I hope you like it, and I hope I explain things uh, clear enough. Uh, if you have any comments, let me know and. Um, I will try to improve things over time. Um, and this is actually my first time, so I really would love to hear about your thoughts and uh, suggestions. Thank you very much, guys. I'll see you in class.